Okay, well, hello and welcome to the McDonald Laurie Institute podcast. I'm Aaron Woodrick, Director of MLI's Domestic Policy Program, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by one of our own senior fellows, Christian Luprecht, who's also a professor at the Royal Military College in Kingston and Director of the Institute of Government Relations at Queen's University, amongst his many other roles. Suffice to say, he's a very busy man, but I'm very pleased to be joined by him today to talk about uh, his new book, uh, Dirty Money, Financial Crime in Canada, of which he is co-editor together with Jamie Farrell. Christian, thanks so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure, Aaron. Thank you. Well, Christian, I guess the obvious question that I like to start with anytime someone writes a book is why? Why this subject? Why did you decide together with Jamie to put this volume together? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, right? So the first is, if you look at this empirically, the last book on this topic dates back 16 years. So one thing we could take away is that it's just not all that important. But of course, we had an entire commission in British Columbia, the Colin Commission on Money Laundering British Columbia, on this topic. It was a hot topic during the Ottawa convoy. Canada is up for a country review by the Financial um, Action Task Force. Um, uh, the uh, Proceeds of Crime Money Laundering Terrorist Financing Act is up for review, and the government has made uh, a host of commitments under the Summit of Democracies agenda. So clearly, this is a topical issue. Uh, so the other way then to look at this is this is a really hard issue to study, but it is highly pertinent for us. And so the objective of this book is to raise the level of informed conversation, because if Canadians don't understand the way financial crime is not just some victimless crime that happens mm -hmm. somewhere out there by a bunch of people moving money or value, but that it is having direct implications for our public safety, our communities, the fentanyl crisis, um, the property rates, uh, the cost of living crisis that Canadians are facing, then I think they might also have more of a motivation to try to contain the problem. And of course, in Canada, we have an outsized problem um, and we have uh, relatively little ability, capacity or political will to do anything about it. Right. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. I kind of want to start uh, with uh, what you mentioned about sort of raising awareness. I think a lot of Canadians think of Canada as, a, you know, we're a wealthy country. Corruption is generally low. Um, what do you think is the biggest misunderstanding that a lot of Canadians have about financial crime and, and what actually happens here? Well, so let's start sort of with taking apart some of the suppositions that you just threw out. Mm -hmm. Any Canadian who thinks that corruption is generally low might just need to look at the Charbonneau Commission. And I would say one of the reasons corruption is perceived to be low is precisely because we don't actually have effective mechanisms to investigate corruption. Uh, so, uh, and, and the RCMP is, I think, simply overwhelmed on too many fronts. These are very complex files. Other countries, such as Australia, in response to these types of challenges have stood up crime and corruption commissions um, at the level of every state and uh, um, at the Commonwealth level. Um, so I would say part of this is simply that uh, people have been getting away with things that they shouldn't be getting away with. And of course, I think that's part of the broader conversation, right? So that there are um, many vested political interests when it comes to money and when it comes to finances in this country. And I think there's also a significant number of people, including in Ottawa and Parliament, who would rather not pull back the rug too far because uh, they themselves uh, might not look all that clean sort of in the end. And so um, that's, I think, the starting point for the conversation. Um, the broader issue is that we simply don't have um, much capacity. If you look at, for instance, FinTrack, the Financial and Transaction Agency of Canada, that's supposedly our financial intelligence unit. Uh, we've been able to show empirically that uh, in a chapter in this book by uh, a former PhD student of mine, Kasia McNaughton, uh, to what extent FinTrack looks different from any other uh, financial intelligence unit in the Western advanced democratic world in the sense that we basically have an administrative unit that does a pretty good job at collecting intelligence and does a pretty terrible job at actually sharing intelligence. Uh, and it doesn't have an enforcement mandate. So it's about as limited an FIU as you can possibly imagine mm -hmm. uh, with a mandate in the democratic world. Um, 
We have police forces that simply don't have the capacity to investigate. You know, in, in other countries, you either have specialized police forces that investigate uh, matters of financial crime. You know, arguably financial crime is perhaps the most complex criminality out there. Um, you have uh, uh, professionals, including lawyers and accountants, that very aggressively try to um, uh, try to essentially hide uh, illicit gains and and move the money, and they become very good at it. Um, in, in, and uh, and so the the only way you can often actually uh, uh, identify those transactions is once they cross jurisdictional boundaries, mm. uh, particularly international borders. Um, and if we have uh, an FIU that doesn't do a great job at sharing, then you can imagine that there's little capacity. And for the RCMP, I mean, look at the uh, chapters by both Peter German uh, and by Gary Clement that demonstrate that there's simply no capacity to actually do this, that uh, uh, we don't have the training, we don't have the expertise, we don't have the staffing, um, and we are torn um, in terms of federal policing and national policing uh, on so many different fronts with so many with so few resources in an organization that Canadians know uh, already faces significant challenges uh, on a host of other fronts um, and um, you know you might say that that's just sort of benign neglect uh, at the federal yeah. level or you might say that that's perhaps because we don't really want to have too close uh, uh, shed too close an eye on it the real, I think, tragedy around this is, of course, the government makes lots of performative announcements around sanctions, uh, but the government has virtually no capacity to actually enforce those if you wanted a litmus test for what I just told you. That's really interesting. I mean, obviously, uh, politicians are, are well known to act out of self-interest. So your point's well taken that, uh, uh, you know, people may be very reluctant to pull back the curtain. Um, even if they perhaps themselves are not guilty, they, they don't know what they would find and they may not like having to defend it or deal with it. So I think that's a very important point. I think to your, your point about the complexity of this crime, I think a lot of um, People have a, a very sort of quaint view of corruption. It's the sort of proverbial cash in a paper bag. But what you're referring to is a lot of very complex uh, digital electronic transactions, uh, which is a lot tougher to to track down than sort of having a sting operation to catch someone with a with a paper bag and not having the capacity uh, to to do that is is obviously one of the reasons why we would never uncover it. Um, but but you know, your book makes clear that there's obviously this is a real problem in Canada. There's a lot of dirty money. I guess a, a, a sort of preliminary question about that is where where is this money coming from? Is this domestic operators? Is it is it criminals in Canada? Is the money coming from outside? Is it uh, people pulling the strings outside but happening on Canadian soil? Where where is the 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 money coming from? In, in, in that, that's part of these crimes. So there's been two key accelerants, I would say, over the last 25 or so years. One is uh, globalization um, and sort of the ease with which you can move money uh, across the world now. And not just money, much of it is moving value. So uh, uh, trade-based money laundering, for instance, perhaps the big, single biggest challenge in terms of financial crime today and uh, arguably potentially the, single, the, the largest amounts of sums uh, that are being moved and virtually very few people actually understand it, except for the people, the bad guys that are engaging in it. Yes, they're usually guys. Um, and, the, uh, and the other is the internet. Uh, and in particular, things such as decentralized finance, cryptocurrency, mm. uh, the ease with which you can actually uh, move money. And I mean, and if you look at so it's this crypto, the, the way that has sort of changed, flipped things around. So previously, um, you would have to, you would try to hide the transactions uh, or, or so, so you would have the transactions and you would try to sort of uh, hide sort of where the money came from and where the money is ultimately destined and going. Well, with the blockchain, you have the exact opposite problem where all the transactions are fully transparent. What you don't know is where the money is coming from and where the money and where the value uh, in terms of uh, is actually going. Um, and a lot of this is, uh, is, is a challenge to trace. The new anonymity of this is a challenge to trace. But really, I think what's uh, the the Common Commission Money Laundering in British Columbia is um, is is emblematic of the challenge that we face in this country. Um, an Australian criminologist actually coined uh, a term for it: snowshoring. Um, that is to say, the particular uh, permissive environment that Canada has created for people to bring their money from offshore here, and then essentially, uh, uh, we look. I mean. We don't. So, so when we bring people, so this is a point that Sana Ahmed makes in her chapter, uh, a law professor of University of Calgary, uh, an immigrant to this country like myself, and so she makes the point 
when we bring people here, we ask all sorts of questions about their background and so forth. But we don't actually ask any questions about money. Nobody really asks or is interested in asking where money comes from. Politicians are just simply happy to have it. They have right. to have it for a number of reasons because it's money and productivity they didn't have to actually uh, do anything for politically. Um, at the municipal level, it drives up property values, which means it also drives up your property sure. tax revenue. Um, and it provides uh, significant input for uh, the construction industry. And we have this lopsided economy in this country that is overly reliant on the one hand on natural resources, and on the other hand, on real estate and, and on construction. And so mm-hmm. um, politicians really don't have much of an interest to ask uh, to ask questions ultimately about where the money comes from. And I think uh, that's the first question Canadians should be asking, because, I mean, where does the money come from? It comes from state capture, so from kleptocrats abroad that are robbing robbing their states blind and whose own countries are ultimately collapsing. It comes from transnational organized crime, the same sort of crime that is providing the fentanyl, the same sort of crime that was uh, that was complicit in, uh, um, in 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 the overall drug epidemic uh, more broadly. That, of course, is then linked directly to gun violence and to to gang crime um, in uh, um, in our cities. Um, so a lot of this is now a, a transnational character. And so the challenge is, if you don't have an effective transnational cooperation uh, capacity you're going to have very little capacity to actually enforce. And if you look at sort of some of the key crimes that are depriving Canadians, uh, think of, for instance, uh, ransomware. Uh, Think of some of the uh, the sanctions issues that are in Canada and Canadian political interest. But think also, for instance, of... uh, of, of of sexual exploitation of uh, of uh, and abuse of uh, of children, one of the most heinous crimes that is out there, um, and the inability, uh, especially in this country, uh, to go, uh, for instance, after the financial flows uh, that uh, uh, that enable it. Now, uh, that being said, I should say we do have very good uh, examples of local cooperation in this country. Mm. So Cameron Field and Pam Simpson. Cameron Field is an ex-Toronto police officer. Uh, uh, Pamela Simpson uh, works for TD, uh, TD Bank in, uh, um, uh, in, in the fraud department. Um, and their chapter shows that when we get together at the local level, and we try to bring together, for instance, financial institutions, the police, to try to go after a very particular problem, for instance, human trafficking, we can actually have a significant impact. Mm. The challenge is, of course, a lot of this requires ultimately federal leadership. And a lot of this transcends Canada's boundaries. And so we ultimately need to bring the federal government on side in these conversations. And we need greater attention from provincial and from local police forces and politicians. But we also simply need to make sure we don't have an environment that is as permissive as it is in Canada um, uh, for uh, for this dirty money to be sloshing around uh, in our cities, in our real estates, uh, and in our financial institutions. Um, yeah, I want to get to what some of those tools uh, that come out in the book, what could be done to tackle this. But but first, I want to, you I mean, we mentioned our peer countries and a lot of what you said um, suggests that Canada is uniquely bad at this compared to some of our peers. And so I guess the, the question a lot of people might have is, given that the same sort of uh, perverse incentives are probably exist everywhere, you know, politicians don't want to peel back the curtain on themselves. What do you think accounts for the fact that Canada is is so uh, is so bad at this? Is it just a unique confluence of, of factors? You mentioned, for example, our over reliance on things like real estate and the fact that uh, uh, the fact that that benefits certain groups, so they have an incentive not to look at it. Um, you know, how do other countries get around this problem uh, and, t- and and take uh, financial crime more seriously? So I think there's three levels to that answer. Mm-hmm. One is the strategic one that ultimately, if we don't make it a political priority it's not going to be where the attention and the resources go, right? Mm-hmm. So look at, for instance, um, after 9-11, we made terrorism a priority. We stood up the integrated national security enforcement teams um, in major cities in this country, and they've been reasonably successful, although I would say at outsized expense um, in terms of containing this particular challenge. So it shows that if we want to have attention, we want to pay attention to a particular issue, we can uh, look at all of a sudden we became interested in uh, in Russian money uh, after the invasion of Ukraine. Again, right. uh, political attention. So that's a strategic sort of leadership that ultimately in a democracy, 
it's politicians that need to set the agenda. It's not politicians that need to decide. It's not ultimately uh, primarily up to the agencies and the folks in uh, the folks in uniform. Uh, then I would say operationally, this is just really hard to do. Even the countries that do that do do reasonably well at this, uh, like the United States, to some extent, the United Kingdom. Um, uh, these are uh, they, it's it's a significant uh, it's a significant challenge, and the only reason they I think do well it is because they have a political interest in it. They have a political mm-hmm. interest in uh, containing, for instance, the ability of certain kleptocrats to use, in particularly uh, U.S. banks, for instance, as a uh, as a transfer point, uh, or to contain, for instance, Russia's ability to finance its aggression on uh, on Ukraine. So, going after sanctions there. Uh, think about sort of the, uh, the the drug challenges that the United States is uh, is facing, but that is an area where Canada could, for instance, be much more supportive in terms of uh, of, of financial crime in this country that's related uh, to this issue. And then I just think tactically. Um, we just simply don't have the people. We don't mm. have the training. Uh, we the integrated um, um, uh, proceeds of crime unit within the RCMP in the 1990s actually did a pretty good job at uh, at containing and tracking some of this. But then eventually, the senior leadership in the RCMP lost interest, and they lost the expertise. Um, there wasn't the training anymore, and so. Now we simply just don't have this. Of course, the government has announced this as the financial as FC three, mm-hmm. um, which is the the uh, the 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 financial uh, uh, crime coordination center. Um, but um, four years after the announcement, and a year after apparently more money was put into the budget for this, everybody's still waiting with bated breath what this entity is going to look like. Is it a coordinating entity? Is it an intelligence entity? Is it going to be an enforcement entity? Is it going to be mainly a data sharing entity? Um, and again, this can be done. So the National Cybercrime Coordination Center, NC3, uh, that took five years to stand up with a clear strategic plan is very effective at this. So it all shows it's all doable mm-hmm. if we want to do it. Uh, but uh, it does require, um, I think, eyes on the ball. And the book is trying to at least draw more eyes on the ball so we get more attention on this. So we hopefully actually get some meaningful movement because it is vital for uh, the health and well-being of our own communities and for the uh, for regional international stability more broadly. You know, in the current context, um, where do you think that Hamas gets most of its money? Uh, it's not because it's not from uh, from legal uh, from legal trade. That I can assure you. Right, right. Well, Christian, if you're upset about the slow movement of government, I've got bad news. I mean, we were looking at uh, cabinet ministers that still don't have mandate letters after two months in their job. So it does not bode well for much more complex projects. You know, you mentioned the, 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 the things that need to happen, including, you know, this has to become a political focus. The fact the problem is very complex. The fact we don't have the resources. Um, you've, partially, you've partially addressed this, but, you know, are there specific additional tools that are called for in this book um, that you think that would make uh, major difference? You also referenced some of these local partnerships. Um, have anything been flushed out either by the government or by some of the experts you've been working with in terms of concrete uh, measures, whether it's more resources, more agencies, uh, um, to, to help uh, battle uh, 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 financial crime. So the two last chapters in the book by Michelle Galant, who's a law professor at the University of Manitoba, and by uh, Jeffrey Simser, who wrote much of the uh, civil asset forfeiture legislation uh, in this country across the various provinces, uh, provide uh, a number of uh, relatively detailed insights into uh, the changes that can happen here and now that don't require very long runways and a lot of budgetary investment, but that would make a very significant investment even in a very short time. Michelle Galan, for instance, points out, I mean, on the beneficial ownership registries that, yes, the government has finally been able to get itself around to having one. But of course, 90 percent of the corporations in this country are actually provincially registered. So they're not actually going to be uh, captured within this registry. Um, and the threshold for the registry that the federal government is setting up is so high uh, that ultimately um, many of the entities that we would want to capture aren't going to be captured. So it shows that, again, we have these sort of performative announcements, uh, but actually doing things that are going to be efficient and effective, that's a different, uh, um, uh, that's a different question. Uh, we probably need to uh, revamp our financial intelligence unit and make sure that it is actually on par 
Um, you know, look, in Australia, the financial intelligence unit, Austrac, hands out billion dollar fines uh, to banks and to financial institutions um, and regularly uncovers uh, uncovers wrongdoing. Um, now, either Canadian financial institutions are very compliant or um, uh, perhaps we need to keep a closer eye on things. Uh, we saw during the Ottawa Conway, for instance, we can get legislative change very quickly when all of a sudden it becomes part of the political mm-hmm. agenda um, when it came to um, ensuring that uh, uh, that virtual assets um, would now sort of fall under the uh, under under the ability of FinTrack to track. Uh, we've talked about the capacities of police forces, but ultimately this has to come from federal leadership. Look, we have a federal police force that spends 85% of its time and resources doing contract policing for the provinces. Um, we can see how decent a job the RCMP is doing at that. So you can imagine that at the federal level, uh, the challenges are no less. Uh, and yet the government has resisted uh, any attempts at sort of uh, systematic reform of the RCMP. Um, uh, and uh, look, I mean, recently uh, Adam Chambers put forward an amendment to the criminal code uh, when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to, to to money laundering and financial crime and trying to provide greater precision and, uh, and more effective penalties here. Uh, and the government decided to defeat that private member's bill on the premise that it was going to roll this into uh, the review of the uh, Proceeds of Crime, Money Laundering, Terrorism Financing Act. But of course, uh, we're already in October here. That review is uh, uh, is already three years overdue. Uh, and it appears that the government is in, on the one hand, no hurry to start it. And on the other hand, is trying to keep the timeline as tight as possible. So, you know, on the one hand, the government defeats the private member's bill by Adam Chambers. On the other hand, uh, it doesn't actually give committee the runway and the timelines that committee would actually need to do a decent job at providing a comprehensive review of everything that needs to be done sort of on the legislative and administrative side. Um, so, you know, let's actually start with having an honest conversation among Canadians and before committee. Uh, let's actually start on with following through on the commitments that we've already made with regards to financial crime. Uh, let's actually follow through on RCMP reform um, and uh, um, and let's try to ensure that we can actually bring the charges that are brought to to completion. Um, I mean, I can give you a host of cases where on both criminal and civil asset forfeiture, those cases have ultimately fallen apart and fallen apart um, uh, largely due to um, uh, due to errors or mistakes um, or inadequacies uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the system that we have in place. Ultimately, I mean, what we need is we need a comprehensive intelligence capacity when it comes to financial crime, um, and we need a comprehensive enforcement capacity. And these two need to be essentially two separate agencies because of the way we prosecute things. Often people have the excuse that, well, under the charter, you can't do these things. And we dispel this very clearly in the book that the charter excuse is simply a lame excuse, that there's many things that we could be doing. And look, I mean, uh, my 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 late colleague uh, Art Cofield, a law professor at Queens, um, uh, with whom I uh, started this book and and this project. Uh, I mean, he testified before the Colin Commission on Money Laundering is that uh, uh, the the financial system in Canada works very well um, for criminals and for the ultra rich. Uh, so you know, I think uh, we can't uh, you know as we we can't be surprised when Canadians are disenchanted with our politicians disenchanted with our democratic institutions when they have a feeling that whether it's democratic institutions or the financial system in place um, doesn't seem to work for them, uh, but seems to work for the people who uh, literally are getting away with murder. Uh, So, you know, I think here's a broader conversation that I think, um, you know, this ties directly into uh, trust and confidence in our institutions, in our Mm -hmm. elected officials. And I think financial crime would be one way uh, that Canadian politicians can send a very clear signal uh, that they have a keen interest in the integrity and the trust uh, that Canadians place in their um, in their institutions, including their financial and tax uh, institutions and those institutions that are supposed to prevent and uh, uh, and investigate and contain uh, corruption um, uh, and the like. 
Right. Well, sir, you, you paint a bleak picture, but I'm hoping that, uh, you know, the, the political pressure, as you, you referred to the convoy, uh, clearly it demonstrates when the government wants to act, it has the capacity to act and act quickly. Um, but here's hoping that perhaps the combination of tensions with China, a diplomatic role with India, um, you know, obviously the, the Hamas-Israel war now, perhaps these things may combine to create the pressure we need to uh, finally see some action from this on the federal government. Uh, as I always like to say to people um, um, that are not keen uh, about how things are going, hope springs eternal. And I certainly hope uh, that's the case on this issue. Um, I want to thank you very much, of course, for your time. The book is Dirty Money, Financial Crime in Canada, edited by Christian Luprecht and Jamie Farrell, published by McGill Queen's University Press. Thank you again, Christian, for joining us today. And thank the rest. Of the, thank you to the rest of you for tuning in. Thanks for the conversation. Take care. Cheers.